Anyway, my, my task this morning is to talk a little bit about the history of aortic surgery, and it's, uh, it's actually quite a, quite a large one. You can debate uh, the necessity for turning a few pages back and looking at some of the early chapters, but uh, uh, I think it's not only entertaining, but it has some value. There's no way to cover all of the individuals involved in the uh, rich history of aortic surgery. Without going back into antiquity, uh, Sir Ashley Cooper was uh, credited with a first but failed attempt to uh, ligate the aorta above an abdominal aortic aneurysm, and then Touffier, the, uh, the thoracic aorta, again with, uh, without success. With, uh, with Modest in uh, New Orleans, uh, finally some progress was made where concepts of taking on aneurysms but leaving the arterial circulation in continuity had finally been, uh, been addressed, and then great strides were made with uh, Alexis Carell and, uh, and Guthrie with the end-to-end -end anastomosis that they'd been able to accomplish in their lab. Now, Carell won the 1912 Nobel Prize for this. He worked with Guthrie, but Guthrie did not. Actually, Guthrie at that time had done something very politically incorrect and had uh, uh, actually anastomosed and uh, transposed a, a dog head onto another dog so that it had two heads. And I think this is really probably what cost him his, uh, his Nobel Prize. At the time, uh, despite these uh, concepts of doing end to end anastomosis, there was still extensive efforts uh, at ligation, including uh, investigations uh, uh, in the lab to a great extent and also uh, uh, in, the, in the operating room with uh, such luminaries as Halstead inventing many devices to accomplish it uh, theoretically more, uh, more safely. But without the full recognition of the potential for end-to-end -end anastomosis, non-suture connections uh, of one end of the vessel to the other was extensively explored by Nietzsche, Peyer, Carell, Touffier, Blakemore, Huffnagel, among others, using a variety of different materials, all of which ended up with uh, pretty much the same results you would expect, erosions and thrombosis. But it did lead to Huffnagel's placement of a, of a, a ball valve, in effect, inside a, uh, a leucite tube. Uh, uh, in the descending thoracic aorta, and it was uh, uh, one patient lived over 10 years with this in place, and it was roughly used in some two to 300 hundred patients. Abdominal aortic aneurysms were attacked in a variety of mechanisms, uh, in, including uh, placing wires inside the, uh, uh, the aneurysm itself. Uh, more back in the uh, mid-1800s with sil silver wire, and then uh, uh, later uh, Karoti with uh, electric current. Uh, Linton's coal pack actually involved the packing of just so much wire in the abdominal aortic aneurysm that uh, no electricity was, uh, was simply required. Not too different than some of the things that we do with the uh, occlusive devices. Cellophane wrapping uh, became popular for a while and it was extensively used by uh, 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 Pop in the mid-1940s. Uh, uh, in fact, Einstein survived seven years after uh, uh, cellophane wrapping and ultimately expired in 1955 where the aneurysm continued to progress and ultimately uh, uh, ruptured. And for all practical purposes at this point in time, all three of these, wiring, wrapping, and ligation, were considered to be relatively equivalent in, in, uh, in therapy. About this time, arteriography uh, uh, came along. Although Capote is uh, frequently quoted as uh, initiating this effort, Berberich uh, uh, preceded him by a couple of years and ultimately in 1940 came here uh, to Mount Sinai. Uh, when uh, Dr. Safi and I were training, uh, translumbar aortography in Dr. DeBakey's unit uh, uh, was the standard and uh, Rinaldo de Santos uh, uh, is credited with uh, the development of this particular technique and his, uh, his son Sid of endarterectomy um, uh, efforts uh, is shown here uh, behind Dr. Uh, DeBakey and, uh, and Dr. Uh, LaRiche. Uh, skipping ahead just a little bit, uh, the the explosion of, uh, of uh, aortic work really couldn't take place until computer CT scanning uh, uh, came along with Hounsville uh, initially in 1973, but Axelbaum in 1976 really reported on some uh, early kind of crude uh, CT scanning in 30 patients describing abdominal as well as thoracic uh, aortic aneurysms, and this was a huge leap forward with regards to volume. About this time, there was a confluence of three uh, remarkable individuals in Houston, Dr. DeBakey in 48, Cooley in 51, Crawford in 54. DeBakey, after having worked with Modis, Oshner, LaRiche, and Kirshner, uh, Cooley with uh, uh, Blaylock and Lord Brock uh, in England, and uh, Crawford at the MGH with uh, Churchill uh, and Allen. Uh, 
Now, uh, Cooley, uh, uh, shortly after uh, coming to Houston, uh, took on a sacular aneurysm, the transverse aortic arch, with simply uh, uh, clamping it uh, and then oversewing it and then uh, uh, re resected it. And this, this was a successful effort. Bonson used the same principle on the ascending aorta, a rather brave uh, uh, effort at the time, and also applied the same techniques to some abdominal uh, aortic aneurysms. And this is uh, Bonson's uh, drawings from his uh, abdominal aortic repair. This was in a, in a patient that actually had had a failed previous uh, uh, wiring. Uh, <clears throat> Schemmert uh, took on the arch aneurysm, again with uh, sort of a lateral repair, but uh, very early on with a, uh, uh, ba the, the use of a shunt to uh, move blood from the ascending aorta, the descending uh, thoracic aorta, so that uh, uh, the arch could be temporarily isolated but uh, repaired laterally without, without replacement. The real nemesis of this, of course, is the, uh, uh, the complications and the morbidity, and great efforts were taken in a variety of different uh, areas uh, to reduce uh, these complications, hypothermia, bypass shunts, and ultimately cardiopulmonary bypass. Cardiopulmonary bypass was really uh, opened up with the, the work of, of Lily High, not only in his cross-circulation uh, uh, techniques, but the work that they were doing there uh, on cardiopulmonary bypass. John Gibbon and his wife Mary, after having worked at the MGH in uh, Churchill's lab, spent about two decades uh, involving even uh, IBM to uh, develop some of the early uh, cardiopulmonary bypass devices, as, as you well may know. They used it uh, uh, five times, one with uh, uh, success. But uh, locally, Mary Martin uh, and uh, Dr. Cooley had, uh, had uh, visited uh, Lily High, and they came back and developed this uh, Cooley coffee pot, which is actually a, literally a coffee pot with a uh, metal uh, coil uh, uh, below it for, uh, uh, for, for de-airing, and it was really based upon the DeWall Lily High uh, oxygenate that you see here on the lower left, but things really didn't explode until we had uh, disposable uh, devices. Uh, Travanol uh, really mass produced these based on the, uh, the efforts of, uh, of, of, of Gott and, uh, and some others. So what do we replace the aorta with? Well, there's the homograph. Uh, Crawford and Gross uh, used it uh, successfully for uh, aortic uh, coarctation, but Henry Swan not only took on coarctation, but took on a post-coarctation aneurysm, replacing a larger length of the descending uh, thoracic aorta in a, a, a young boy who actually lived uh, uh, six months and died of uh, other issues. Uh, DeBost uh, then uh, took a patient who had had a previous uh, cellophane wrapping that uh, was obviously failing and went in and replaced the abdominal aorta with a homograft. Uh, DeBakey, uh, working with Cooley very shortly thereafter, had uh, six surviving patients of a similar operation out of, uh, out of seven that they uh, attempted. <clears throat> Worried about dilatation of the homograft, uh, an early effort uh, that, uh, that, that failed by Lamb and Aram was to place a homograft inside a leucite tube, kind of a confluence of some of these uh, concepts uh, for the descending uh, uh, thoracic aorta. But it really wasn't successful until this report by DeBakey and Cooley where a homograft was used to replace the uh, lower uh, descending thoracic uh, aorta. And then shortly thereafter, they reported what they considered to be the first distal arch, again using uh, homograft. But homographs, as you know, deteriorate uh, uh, over time. Nevertheless, um, Etheridge, uh, is credited with uh, using a homograph to replace the thoracoabdominal uh, aorta, uh, where the uh, celiac axis, supermesenteric artery, uh, were reattached uh, uh, to the homograft, and this sort of opened the gates to in this one case with a uh, homograph. In that in that article, he basically says, and only a surgeon could do this, that now the problem solved. This is the way it's going to be from uh, from here on out. Uh, we've now uh, uh, cured the situation. Uh, however. <clears throat> Buried in a report that probably predated Etheridge, uh, six patients out of 33 by, uh, by Rob uh, had uh, uh, grafts placed in the visceral and just above. Uh, and uh, in the consequence, uh, he's, he's kind of ignored sometimes, but uh, may have uh, and probably did predate uh, Etheridge. Not to be outdone, Dr. DeBakey took this same concept, did four patients, and had a 50% <clears throat> survival rate. What they would do is they would take an Envelon sponge tube, place it from above to below, creating, a, in effect, a bypass graft, completely remove the aneurysm, replace it with a homograft, and then take down Envelon sponge. The um, uh, daunting surgery, uh, uh, no, no doubt. And Dr. Cooley replaced the, uh, uh, the ascending aorta with an early use of cardiopulmonary bypass, again using a, a, a homograft.
but uh, the arch remained a, a, a daunting challenge, uh, and it ultimately was uh, with cardiopulmonary bypass 1957 that Dr. DeBakey finally got a, a survival. Schaefer and Harden attempted with a, a, a shunt, uh, tried to replace the, uh, uh, the arch. This patient basically fibrillated when they started the operation, was fibrillating the whole time, and uh, died an hour postoperatively. Uh, similar problems with, uh, uh, with fibrillation, but, uh, uh, but really a demise secondary to uh, a stroke was this effort by uh, Denton Cooley using basically the same concept. And then also in Houston, Oscar Creech, uh, again, using Envelon sponge bypass is pretty similar to what I showed you for the uh, thoracoabdominal aorta, and then replacing the, uh, the arch with the homograft. Uh, this patient died on day uh, 11, secondary to infection, and then hemorrhage. And finally, DeBakey uh, had a success uh, in 1956 using cardiopulmonary bypass and, interestingly, anti-grade cerebral uh, perfusion. But the homograph wasn't going to uh, be the, uh, the end all. They had to have something that was off the shelf that was... Uh, a uh, variety of sizes, lengths, and of course uh, uh, address some of the durability issues. And actually, despite the fact that folklore uh, really sort of says that this was a serendipitous uh, uh, issue with Dr. Uh, DeBakey, actually, in fact, what was going on was a very thorough, methodical, extensive search for the, uh, the, the best material, and ultimately Dacron, uh, Dacron won out. And with this, they were able to attack the thoracoabdominal aorta in a way they hadn't before. Uh, and with, a, with, a, with a homograph, there were some limitations, uh, but now with Dacron, uh, length was no longer a problem. And with these bypasses, in effect, uh, extra anatomic, as it were, and then uh, grafts placed off of that into the visceral uh, renal vessels, not much attention was paid to the, the intercostal arteries. With this attack on the aorta, Dr. DeBakey uh, uh, and some others, I would guess, became, uh, became literally rock stars uh, uh, at the time. The proximal aorta uh, really uh, uh, opened up with, uh, with Al Starr, uh, first with the mitral and then with the uh, aortic valve, and then rapidly became uh, uh, to everyone's attention that the, uh, the, the air, air, something had to be done about the aortic root in toto. Uh, Myron Wheat uh, in Florida devised this clever technique to replace the aortic valve and the ascent in the aorta and just bring the coronary arteries up as flaps, not too much dissimilar to what he had described for type 1, uh, type A aortic uh, uh, dissection. But uh, things really didn't open up until Hugh Buntall uh, and De Bono reported on their, their one page. One, one case with a composite valve graft, of which everyone knows a great deal, and interestingly, there was only one uh, reference, and it was uh, an early paper from Denton Cooley. The modifications of this have been interesting over time. Um, uh, Cabral is probably one of the, uh, the more notable, where a Dacron graft is placed to the aorta around the origins of the coronary uh, arteries to maintain the circulation. And at the time, with the materials not being sealed as we have today, uh, the, the, the wrapping and then the uh, right atrial uh, appendage shunt to that for uh, decompression. And then, of course, Nick Kachukas changed things uh, uh, again for the better, uh, showing us that uh, with these sealed grafts, a button technique has better short-term and uh, long-term uh, uh, viability. Uh, certainly a very, very important contribution that uh, I think pretty much has dominated the situation since. And then a paradigm shift, of course, with uh, Tyrone David. Much discussion yesterday about this, going back to the Jatin Yakub remodeling and really settling on variations of the uh, uh, inclusion technique. Uh, uh, the, the latter's the discussion is, is almost shifted from uh, not whether to do it, but the the, uh, the, the nuances of uh, of how to do it. And of course, Francis Robichek and his uh, uh, extensive work over uh, Lestria's career has taught us so much about so many things, including uh, aortic wall stress and models for bicuspid valves, and much much more. Can't leave out aortic dissection with um, the work. Uh, uh, Dr. DeBakey did here initially with six patients and uh, four survive survivors. But I might mention that uh, George Morris in DeBakey's unit did the first uh, type 1 aortic dissection with an end and anastomosis in a 32-year-old uh, uh, physician. Uh, he resuspended the aortic valve and it was competent. His, his root and aorta eventually dilated up very substantially, and I helped Gerald Lowry reoperate on this gentleman some 20 or so uh, uh, years, uh, year, years after this, and he did quite well for many, many years following that. We did a, a bentel and a bevel, bevel arch on him, but uh, Dr. DeBakey was intensely interested in aortic dissection, and finally with a report 
of 179 repairs, he was finally able to settle on what became known as the DeBakey classification, followed in two years later, 1970, with the, uh, the Stanford classification. And these uh, uh, remain valuable in our understanding of the disease process. And Dr. Stanley Crawford taught us to leave the operating room with a live patient. You don't go uh, attacking the aortic arch when it isn't necessary in acute dissection. Of course, this was uh, uh, a reflection of the era. Uh, I know many, uh, many units now are taking on this situation with a little different, uh, uh, a little different result. But, the, but the, at the time, the concept was get the patient off the table alive. I'm not going to go through all the iterations of, of aortic arch repair, but I might mention that uh, uh, um, Bloodwell is known for the, uh, the island patch. Frist actually was one of the earlier users of uh, anti-grade cerebral perfusion and SABIC uh, axillary artery cannulation. And I'll just mention a couple of these. Bloodwell um, uh, in, in the unit in Houston 1968 was actually inter interested in the um, subclavian steel syndrome with regards to this particular operation and it sort of serendipitously uh, uh, in the cases that he reported had these drawings of an island uh, uh, reattachment of the, uh, the, the head vessels. Uh, and, and of course um, Dr. Grieb changed everything uh, uh, dramatically with, uh, uh, with his uh, revisiting the use of uh, deep hypothermic and circuitory arrest, building on some of the things that have been going on in children uh, in others, but really uh, uh, changed, uh, uh, changed this, uh, this, this whole concept for, for decades, uh, decades to come. Efforts were made to try to improve on this. UEDA's uh, um, recognized for retrograde uh, uh, perfusion, but uh, Dr. Greep, both in the laboratory and pigs, as well as in animals, is really drawn into question uh, the nutrient uh, aspects of um, retrograde cerebral perfusion. And as you mentioned yesterday, there's, uh, there may be some value with regards to maintaining low temperature, although for most, uh, most cases it's probably not necessary. And there may be some flushing aspects of this, uh, but it uh, really has uh, fallen into much less use than, than previous, previously. Jean Bichet is noted for sort of revigorating the uh, interest in uh, anti-grade cerebral perfusion. And then Kasui helped uh, popularize this with uh, larger numbers, larger series. And then uh, from here, David Spielvogel has um, uh, revamped how we think about replacing the transverse aortic arch, as we discussed a great deal uh, uh, yesterday with these uh, trifurcated uh, and bifurcated uh, graphs, which adds a lot of uh, utility and flexibility to these operations, making them much, much safer and, of course, has been adapted to the endovascular uh, uh, techniques uh, so well, as well as uh, allowing us to uh, use it. Anti-grade cerebral perfusion, either through the innominate artery or the axillary artery, and maintaining uh, uh, or doing an operation where the actual circulatory arrest of the brain is, is really just a matter of a few minutes, even in very complex <clears throat> repairs. And then finally, Stanley Crawford, of course, with what he did with thoracoabdominal uh, aortic aneurysms, initially with uh, uh, 42 patients and a 26 percent survival rate. He built on this experience of Dr. DeBakey with this sort of extra anatomic and then build off of this graph to replace the uh, uh, visceral vessels without much attention to the intercostals to a report on, four, on 28 cases, uh, 23 initially, but actually in the discussion he adds another five and describes this, uh, this uh, uh, approach of a, uh, of a more anatomic in situ reconstruction which did at that time re readily adapt itself towards addressing uh, intercostal arteries with a remarkable 7% mortality rate. So he really changed the, uh, the, the, the business here from Rob Etheridge to DeBakey's reports uh, uh, and down to a 7% mortality. And then to further mention, he had 605 patients uh, written up, presented a year earlier, but written up in uh, 1986, where he uh, described the uh, four uh, uh, extents that everyone still uses uh, for uh, the uh, thoracobdominal aneurysm with really remarkably low paraplegia rate across the board, although extent two aneurysms with a 28% uh, paralysis rate uh, uh, continued to be to be a problem. And of course you have to mention Hans Borst's contribution with extensive aneurysms using the elephant trunk and then ultimately Dr. Crawford's experience with 1,509 thoracoabdominal aneurysms with paraplegia down to 7 percent and the mortality rate maintained at about 8 percent. Uh, an absolutely uh, phenomenal uh, experience uh, at, at a time where it was still pioneering work. Things have changed completely as we saw yesterday and we're going to see more today. Uh, uh, Perotti uh, 
uh, really sort of paved the way for endovascular work, but he was probably preceded by Velotos. Uh, uh, there's been uh, dramatic improvements in what uh, uh, Juan C. has done uh, 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 since his first, first description, but uh, Velotos actually uh, uh, preceded him with a report in 1988, where he uh, more fully described in 1991 uh, uh, 51 patients using basically the same techniques, and this work was going on simultaneously. And if you know Juan, Juan in his presentations actually refers to this particular uh, work now, given Velotos' uh, recognition. So again, you can debate whether or not uh, turning the pages back and looking at some of this uh, is, is worthwhile, but uh, life has to be lived forward, and there's no question that the dramatic changes are still coming with uh, ultimately, I'm sure, culminating in total uh, replacement of the aorta from the aortic valve to the bifurcation and beyond with uh, endovascular techniques, uh, including the use and adaptation of some of the technology that we're learning with the, uh, uh, the various uh, uh, TAVR, TAVR devices. One thing's for sure, we're going to have to work more closely with our interventional radiologists, cardiologists, and vascular, vascular surgeons. But, you know, in addition to uh, uh, all of the pioneers and the, uh, uh, the, the, her uh, the, the heroes that I've described here and left out probably more than I've actually mentioned, uh, you know, sometimes we fail to mention that, uh, you know, along the way there were not only these heroic efforts by, on the part of these uh, uh, remarkable surgeons, but I think we have to give credit to a lot of brave patients and a lot of brave families along the road that's led to what we do today. And I'd like to thank the organization for the opportunity to share this with you this morning.